Every day, our hands touch billions of bacteria, fungi, yeasts, and viruses. Luckily for us though, our skin has the incredible ability to not just protect us from infection, but also provide a nice environment for beneficial microbes to live. However, today, I'm really going to put that all to the test, as well as my immune system. The CDC clearly outlines the benefits of hand washing, from simply getting rid of poo particles to some save the kids propaganda. For the next 24 hours, I'm not going to wash my left hand, and then I'm going to swab it at regular intervals for science. After incubating these samples in some agar, we're going to use our senses and microscope to try and figure out just what grows when you stop washing your hands. Now, before we get started, we need something to grow these microbes in. That's where agar comes in. Nutritional agar is a gelatinous substance derived from red algae and fortified with nutritional yeast and complex sugars. These not only help with cultivating fungi, yeast, and bacteria, but also can act as a vegan substitute for gelatin. Preparing and sterilizing these dishes in the microwave will provide a nice environment to grow whatever ends up on my hand. We're going to need nine total dishes for our experiment today. Two are going to be controls, one of just the raw agar, and one for my hand directly after I wash and sanitize my hands. This will give us an accurate sample to compare with, just in case soap and hand sanitizer are lying about how much bacteria they kill. After our controls, I've picked seven more intervals that we'll swab and sample at 10 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, three hours, six hours, 12 hours, and finally 24 hours. I'm going to sample my hands and we're going to see the progression of bacteria growth. And the first thing we need to do is wash our hands, the CDC approved way. Happy birthday to you. After singing my ABCs and lathering my hands, I then also applied some hand sanitizer to thoroughly ensure a clean surface for all the nasties that live on earth to attach themselves to. This is going to be our first swab for our control. Hopefully not much grows, so we'll be seeing what remains after our cleaning procedure. By swabbing my hand and fingers, I'm able to transfer whatever's on this swab to the petri dish, which I'll be incubating on this heating pad since I'm way too cheap to buy a real incubator. Now that we've set up our materials, we can finally get this, frankly, disgusting test started. So obviously the first thing I did was go stand outside with my hands in the wind for 10 minutes. Hello, bees. I did this not just because I'm insane, but because I was curious about how much crap is in the wind blowing around us and what my hand might pick up. Air and wind is an incredible medium for carrying around stuff in general. It pollinates our plants, carries salt from the ocean, and most importantly, blows around countless microorganisms from soil, fungi, plants, and animals. I thought this would be a great place to start for our first sample. Afterwards, I went to do what healthy people generally try and do, go for a 20 minute run. I wanted to get all nice and sweaty, and because I'm single, this is the best way to do so. Sweat contains mostly water, but more importantly, a cocktail of electrolytes, urea, ammonia, sugars, proteins, and hormones. These provide an excellent environment for certain microorganisms to grow, including those that make some humans smell absolutely atrocious. Surprisingly, sweat itself actually doesn't really smell, but certain bacteria such as Staphylococcus and Carinobacterium break down the compounds in sweat into stinky chemicals that are responsible for our body odor. Swabbing after this, we'll capture whatever microbes are carried away by my sweat, and we'll get a good look at them in the petri dish. Now, because I'm only a slightly filthy animal, I'm gonna shower. But to keep this experiment going, I'm using a glove to try and maintain the integrity of this experiment. And what do people do after a run in a shower? Instagram reels. So that's what I did. Besides rotting your brain, your phone also serves a bunch of microbes. It is one of the most microbially molested items that you touch on a day-to-day -day basis, even dirtier than your toilet seat, unless you're really terrible at pooping. Everything in our environment can end up on our phones at some point, including skin oils, makeup, toilet flush particles, earwax, and saliva. All of these can carry a pretty large amount of microbiota of various types. Our controls still unfortunately grew a few colonies of bacteria and yeast, which means that there was some contamination during my process, but not enough that I would actually be worried. Especially having seen some of the other dishes, I think it likely didn't affect the results very much. Interestingly, after disinfecting my hand, it seems they had already picked up a variety of microbes. Five colonies, it looks like. It is also possible that some were never killed in the first place. We can make some guesses on what these colonies may be by their shape, color, structure, smell, and their microscopic structure. But I'ma be real, you couldn't pay me to smell these, even though researchers do it all the time, so these are really just best guesses. Based on these observations, I think what we might have here is some actinomyces, some yeast, some bacillus bacteria, and maybe some penicillin mold. Now, we can either assume that I'm just apocalyptically filthy, or more likely, my wet hands picked up some stuff in the air in between me washing them, drying them, and then swabbing. After 10 minutes of my hand being in the wind, you can see we picked up a very large fungus. As scary as this may look, it's probably just a few spores. Each circle represents one species of microbe, but 
It looks like there's a couple on this plate, most likely some aspergillus or penicillium. Under the microscope, we can clearly identify and see the mycelium, hyphae, and fungal spores that these molds produce. These are likely what my hand picked up in the wind, since the rest of the colonies look similar to the bacteria from the previous plate. After my run, at the 30 minutes mark, things started to get pretty interesting. My post-run clarity resulted in some dense clusters and spreading colonies of microbes. Likely a species of Proteus or Bacillus bacteria, these bacteria are motile and able to spread across the petri dish in these web-like structures. Meanwhile, these small circular colonies are likely Staphylococcus or Micrococcus. <laughs> Interestingly, the majority of fungi from the previous petri dish have pretty much disappeared. The combination of salts, water, urea, and lactate from sweat combined with a higher body temperature are a much better breeding ground for specific bacteria, yeasts, and fungi. This means that whatever bacteria came out of my sweat likely outcompeted any fungi that we might have picked up during and before the run. Just like how different trees grow better and are more adapted to grow in certain environments, like evergreens and deciduous trees, different microbes prefer different levels of salt, acidity, humidity, and various other factors. Surprisingly, at the one hour mark, despite having worn a glove while showering, it looks like many of these colonies were either killed or rubbed off. My hypothesis is that nitrile gloves weren't perfectly sealing off some of the soap and that it provided an environment best suited for the, I think, Proteus and Bacillus species that we see on this petri dish. For the next couple hours, I tried to emulate what I imagine people do in the evening. So like any red-blooded American, I hopped in my truck and headed to the liquor store. Besides killing people's brain cells and giving us excuses for bad decision-making, alcohol, like the stuff you might find in hand sanitizer and scotch, actually doesn't kill certain microorganisms. Alcohol disinfects things by breaking down the fats and denaturing proteins in cells, but certain bacterial spores, viruses, and fungi are resistant to this. This could potentially be part of the reason why our control sample grew a bit more than expected. In any case, I'm trying to pick up a variety of microbes that exist in our public places, so next I went to the grocery store to grab some dinner. In a place like this, you'll get a nice mix of all the crap that your fellow humans carry and spread around. Simply breathing, touching, and existing can spread all sorts of stuff. Some fungi can even launch their spores into the air. Viruses in your saliva spread when you breathe, and bacteria can simply just float away. And here I am, trying to collect some of that in the form of a salad and a zesty drink. Making my way back, I swad my hand for the next sample. After this, to up the chances of gathering a multitude of contaminants, I prepared dinner for myself. This consisted of my salad and zesty drink that I acquired from the grocery store, as well as heating up some buffalo chicken wings. While eating, especially with our hands, we get to introduce a multitude of microbes to our skin, from those in our mouth, to those in our food, and even on the utensils that we touch. More importantly, this process adds other various compounds to our hands that could inhibit or promote the growth of certain bacteria, yeast, and fungi. The peppers and vinegar in the hot sauce, meat particles from the chicken, and salad leaves all provide different environments for different microbes. I swabbed once again after this scrumptious meal, so let's see what grew. After our trip to acquire booze and food, we still have the usual suspects of Staphylococcus and Micrococcus, as well as the wrinkled bacillus colonies that were visible in our earlier samples. These are generally very common to find on people's skin. Now this fuzzy, milky growth in the center is a fungus of some sort, but different to the ones that we saw earlier. This suggests that there may have been mold present in one of the environments I was in. The off-white, creamy colonies that are slightly raised off the surface turned out to be yeast, possibly Saccharomyces. These can be from fresh produce, airborne spores, or even transferred from some of the baked goods lying around, even though I didn't actually touch any of these. To my surprise, although the number and diversity of colonies increased, there actually still isn't anything out of the ordinary. After our meal, we can see the diversity of microbes completely disappear. Gone are the individual colonies of fungi, yeast, and bacteria, and instead we have a widespread, cloudy colony of motile bacteria. This, what is likely Lactobacillus, Streptococcus, and Neisseria, is likely from my saliva, and it can spread very quickly and efficiently across this nutrient-packed agar plate. Take a look at just how cloudy this agar has become. This may suggest that enzymes produced by these oral bacteria, the same enzymes that help you digest food, have started breaking down the agar in the plate. In fact, most of the bacteria that we find in or on our bodies are not dangerous, but extremely helpful or even necessary for our survival. So despite how nasty these growths might seem, there's actually really nothing to worry about. But what about after 24 hours of literally zero hygiene? After my meal, I basically just brushed my teeth and went straight to bed after watching a few more Instagram reels. 
Four and a bit hours later, I was awake once again to swab my hands for science. A sniff test also confirmed that I did indeed eat buffalo wings last night. In the 12 hours after that, I went about my normal routine. I brushed my teeth again, took a dump, worked a little bit, and even did some gardening. This is where I thought I was most likely to encounter some of the most dangerous organisms and why I left it for last. I also didn't eat because I only eat once a day, so there won't be any saliva or food to completely take over our sample. In my morning sample, you might notice that it looks quite similar to the control swab and the post-run swab that I took after 30 minutes. I think that this combination of fungi, bacteria, and yeasts might just be my skin's natural microbiome. Especially after sleeping, my skin has had time to come to homeostasis, in other words, find its own balance. This collection of microorganisms likely have outcompeted anything else that was growing there. However, the story changes after my gardening extrusion. Now, we can see a pretty diverse, large number of colonies. The white, fluffy colonies are likely some sort of Fusarium or Cladosporium molds. These are frequently found on plants and in the soil. Some of the yellow and other pigmented colonies could be Micrococcus luteus. This is frequently found in dust and soil as well. Some of the small, round colonies may also be some species of Pseudomonas and Rhizobium bacteria, which are known for their nutrient cycling and nitrogen fixing properties. Both of these are very important for boosting soil health. This experiment showed me just how diverse our microbiomes are, and how they interact with the macrobiomes that are in the environments around us. It also taught me that washing your hands is great, but it's really just a precaution. Looking at my petri dishes, I don't think I grew anything quite that dangerous, although without a professional analysis, I might never know. Hand washing is a precaution that we take just in case we encounter something that's actually dangerous. It's the same reason we wash vegetables before we eat them, just in case there's some E. coli. Besides that, there is really no point in being a germaphobe. In fact, some people actually hypothesize that many allergies and autoimmune diseases may actually be caused by living in an environment that is way too clean. They theorize that it can cause our own immune systems to overreact to harmless microorganisms and other factors. So yes, you should still wash your hands, but if you forget, it's not that big of a deal, it probably won't kill you. Thanks for watching.